so welcome everybody to today's um, short circuit webinar. Uh, my name is Rose Gregorio. I'm a communication dissemination and exploitation officer at the IT Urban Mobility. And we're very happy to have you here and also our experts to discuss um, battery dismantling in reverse logistics. So before we begin, um, I would like to give a short introduction to the Battery Burst project. So Battery Burst is a research and innovation project funded under the Horizon Europe program. We are working to increase the safety, efficiency, and sustainability of the reverse logistics process for lithium ion batteries. We are 11 different partners from different countries in Europe, and we are composed of innovation actors, research organizations, SMEs, and all working together. So what was the need to create a project such as ours? Well, as we transformed uh, our transport into electrified ones, as we uh, use more and more electric vehicles, um, we started to realize that there will be a problem in the near future with regards to uh, end of life batteries or end of first life um, EV batteries. Um, by 2030, we expect that there will be over 100,000 um, tons of EV batteries that will have reached its um, end of first life in Europe alone. So there is a big challenge with regards to how to reuse or repurpose these batteries, or basically the reverse logistics process of this. Um, so in order to create a, a robust and efficient process, we are facing several challenges. And I have listed some of the main challenges here. So for example, there is no virtual uh, space for safe sharing of information between um, battery stakeholders. And this is very important because um, you know, stakeholders need to know where the battery has been, if it's been in an accident. So all this important information, and there's common, currently no common space for this. Um, there is no universal process for discharge and energy recovery for different types of batteries, different, different designs, different types have to have their own processes, which is um, costly and inefficient. Um, there is slow and non-standardized uh, assessment of state of health and state of safety, um, and which is, important for rapid decision-making uh, to decide whether the battery should go to um, their second life or if they should be uh, recycled. Um, there's also costly transportation of batteries. Um, we need special vehicles for them, special drivers, special packaging, um, and this is costly. And of course, the reason why we are here today is about battery dismantling. Um, the practices have been largely manual, and this, of course, poses risks to humans. So Battery Verse was created in order to address these challenges, and these are our objectives. So we are going to create a um, more precise uh, battery assessment using acoustic testing and machine learning algorithms. We will create safety packaging um, to minimize thermal runaway risks during transportation. We will improve automated dismantling um, for dismantling and sorting of battery components. And of course, we will contribute to the battery data space through standardized labeling, streamlined battery identification, and data sharing functionalities. So that's it for the Battery Burst project. So now I will hand you over to one of our experts, Xavier Cole. He is a founder and CTO of battery upcycling uh, startup Circulion. So his presentation will be about robotic battery disassembly for upcycling and recycling. So Xavier, if you're ready, I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Thanks a lot, uh, Rose, for the introduction. I'm Xavier, uh, as Rose said, CTO and co-founder of Circulion. And today I'm going to run you through um, automated battery disassembly, mostly focusing on challenges and solutions for those challenges. So Circulion is on a mission to automatically handle the next 3 billion lithium ion batteries by 2040. That includes from small 
to large EV or even bus batteries. If you look at a battery pack today, uh, you can split that battery pack into multiple different components, from the casing to the interior, the plastic, the cells, cables, as well as a BMS. And an automated disassembly enables two things. First, upcycling screens of components that can be reused. Here we can enable 55 to 100. Maybe we can mute everybody. There's somebody speaking. We can enable 55 to 100 euros um, of value for a second life application of, of batteries. And the second part is clean material streams. Why is that important? Because you enable more efficient downstream okay. recycling. For example, you can increase the efficiency of, of a shredder um, by up to 50%. So if you look at today's uh, challenges, so today the, the disassembly of EV battery packs is, is fully manual and it doesn't scale. So on the left-hand side, you have two examples of two um, well-known battery packs where the disassembly times, uh, which we took from literature, um, are up to 300 minutes to go down to, to battery level. And of course, uh, manual labor in Western countries is, is very expensive. It's also scarce. And we will not have enough to disassemble the next wave of EV battery packs and all the battery packs that come off the market as end of life. Uh, battery packs and therefore we need to have semi-automated and go down to even fully automated processes to reduce the disassembly time of of these battery packs for us to be really able to treat um the uh, the large amount of ev battery packs now when it comes to to more specific challenges um, today, we see on the market a, a variety of different battery pack designs um, from early on conversion designs like the um, VVE Golf um, to more newer battery platforms like the VW ID uh, platform. And the main challenges we categorized here in three different ones. So there is the difficulties and challenges when it comes to pre-handling. Um, the second challenge is, is the, the large variance and, and uh, of, of tooling and equipment that is needed um, to do automated disassembly and custom designs. And thirdly, it is complex computer vision challenges that need to be overcome to enable semi-automatic and fully automatic disassembly for these battery packs to enable, as I said at the beginning, clean material streams or upcycling streams. So we're going to the first challenge. So if an EV battery pack has reached its end of its first end of life in its primary application, it arrives at the site and you need to do pre-handling, which encompasses uh, five steps. Um, you need to inspect the battery pack, unpack it, drain the cooling, and make sure that the battery pack is, is safe to be discharged. Because from our customer feedbacks um, with large recyclers, the discharging is really the um, is the most dangerous step when it comes to um, to to handling um, battery lithium ion battery packs. So therefore, during the discharging, you want to do a, a pre diagnostics. The battery packs that are not used for upcycling, you want to enable a deep discharge or charge the, the modules to a desired states to diagnose them for a second life application. So the second uh, main challenge that today I want um, to highlight is the flexible equipment that you need to have for your robotic cell. That is why um, today at Circulion we focus on developing and deploying in our facilities and at customer sites automation on two of these um, four main uh, steps in an EV disassembly. First, it comes, um, it is for battery pack opening, where you have in EV battery packs up to 222 screws that need to be removed to enable the assembly. And uh, whoever has ever um, assembled uh, an IKEA shelf, if you need to repeatedly 
um, disassemble 222 screws day in, day out, uh, your arms become uh, rather heavy. And their automation and flexible um, automation um, is the key. In the second step, uh, we see today uh, still a lot of manual interactions because the human is the most flexible worker um, in, in that disassembly step. And then the next step um, is the module removal. Um, so for all the EV pack designs that have a, a cell to module to pack design, the module removal is key um, to uh, diagnose or um, discharge the modules to enable, as I said in the beginning, clean material streams or upcycling um, streams. And then lastly, um, you wanna have um, clean material streams. That means if you have an aluminum casing of, of the battery, an aluminum housing, you want to remove as much material so you have a very high grade um, aluminum um, um, material stream that can go into recycling. To give you um, another example, um, while uh, what makes this assembly um, a challenging for specific battery packs. So I want to give here a concrete example um, when it comes to removing the lid. So in the first example, you see an, an Audi e-tron battery pack where we can automatically remove the skills, um, remove all the screws. Um, but then it becomes more challenging when you want to remove a, a glued lid. And you can see here, this battery pack is using um, a, a glued uh, ceiling that sticks, rather, um, sticks a lot to, to the lid. Um, on the Ford Kuga, you have a, a firm, a you have a firm adhesive effect of the the, the inlet um, ceiling. For the for this BMW, you have a, a flat, an inserted flast gasket. Um, this is a very nice design because it's very easy to open up. And then um, the VW um, has also an an inlet ceiling um, that is easy to uh, remove. But what you can see is even within an, 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 an OEM, a larger OEM group, um, VW and, and Audi are using sometimes very different um, designs to, um, to build their EV battery packs. There's also another dimension that can um, include difficulties when it comes um, to this assembly, but these are more edge cases. That means if an EV battery pack um, was, for example, repaired and the manual repairing process uses different components than in the initial process, you really need to design disassembly processes that are uh, robust. So to have a flexible disassembly uh, process, we collect a lot of data on all the different battery packs. For example, to have our AI model to detect screws to guide the robot in the right position to do the unscrewing. Therefore, we collect a large amount of images, train our models, and can identify the right positions or features within a battery pack to have a flexible disassembly of specific skills of robotic cells. So with our hardware, uh, the battery library and the data we collect um, we have developed a, a flywheel that enables us with, with more battery packs that we process in our robotic disassembly lines. The more data we can collect, for example, images of different screw types, um, which are saved in our battery data, data platform and with which we can continuously uh, train our models. So our battery library of battery packs that we can automatically treat uh, will grow um, more and more. To give you a concrete example, you have here uh, a, a camera mounted to our unscrewing device and our AI model can automatically detect um, the screw type, which is a, T, a, T, a Torx 40, and the position um, of the screw to guide the robot to do the disassembly. Moreover, we are also detecting um, cable connections. Here you can see a segmentation of specific EV cables. These cables are today still removed uh, manually, but we are in research with international uh, collaborations to also automate, um, do a, in a deeper disassembly of, um, of EV battery packs.
And if you like these videos, you can find more videos um, on our website, how our disassembly processes work. To to end up um, to end my 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 short presentation today on challenges and solutions um, for automated disassembly, I uh, want to give an outlook um, on where automated disassembly can lead to or will lead to in the future. So today in our Circulion facility in Germany, we have already a line life that disassembles small battery packs um, below two kilowatt hours down to cell level. This line focuses on small battery packs for micromobility, e-bikes, um, and power tools and treats cylindrical cells. And e the highest recycling code in the future you can enable by doing direct recycling. Therefore, we will and are investigating how we can open up these um, cells or even modules of EV battery packs to um, re automatically remove the, the jelly rolls or the layers of cathode and anode inside the cells to enable direct recycling. Always um, staying core to our knowledge, which is automated disassembly, the downstream um, recycling we are not touching. And if you're looking for uh, a, a, a new challenge, we're currently hiring in multiple different departments uh, from mechanical uh, to automation and software development. Um, and as I mentioned, if you want to uh, see some more of our disassembly videos, you can go on our website and um, check them out there. Thanks you a lot. Thank you a lot for your uh, attention and um, giving the mic back to Rose. Thank you very much, Xavier. Um, that was a very nice presentation. Uh, I, I particularly like the, the videos that you showed. That was very cool. Um, since we're uh, right at the edge, well, now it's uh, 5.20. So um, if you have any questions, please save them for the Q&A later. Um, uh, we do have a Q&A portion to this webinar. So please save your questions. Uh, for that, or you can type your questions in the chat now, but we will ask um, our experts to answer them during that, um, that period. Okay, so now it's time for the panel session with our experts. This session will be moderated by my colleague, Philip Tseng. So Philip, please um, take it away. Hi, um, welcome also from my side. Um, my name is Philip Tseng. I'm uh, working for BAX, um, an innovation consultancy located in Barcelona, spread across multiple countries in Europe. Um, and we're, we're focusing on helping our clients bring their ideas towards the market. And um, specifically in the batteries focus area, um, we, have, we have a couple of uh, consultants involved. And um, I would like to, to thank again Xavier for the nice presentation as well. Um, I think this is this is great uh, food for discussion also. Um, but I would like to um, take the opportunity first to introduce our um, two other expert uh, panel speakers today. Uh, one of them is Tero Carlela um, at, uh, from the Centria University of Applied Sciences. Tero, would you like to introduce yourself quickly? Yes, of course. So my name is Tero Carla, and I work as a robotics researcher for Centria University of Applied Sciences here in Finland. And currently I am coordinating a project called Recirculate, which is pretty similar to battery reverse. We have same goals and we have pretty much very much same content in our project. So it's really nice to be here today and discuss about robotized disassembly. And the robotized disassembly is the thing I'm focusing on developing during the circulate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we also have Jeff Peters in the discussion um, from the uh, University KU Leuven. Would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yes. So, uh, Jeff Peters, University of Leuven, uh, located in Belgium. Uh, working on robotic disassembly and design for disassembly for the last 10 years and now also in several national projects on yeah, EV and battery disassembly uh, as well as other case studies and so um, professor here at the department. Great, um, thank you. Um, I would I would like to to follow up uh, with you Jeff with the first question I'm 
I think uh, Xavier has has shown it quite nicely. We have a huge variety of different um, designs um, coming from OEMs, um, different cell designs, but also different uh, structural designs uh, inside um, inside the the EV battery itself. Um, how how does that make it difficult? I mean, Xavier has has mentioned it. What is what is your opinion the the key challenge there in trying to enable automatic systems which well will have to be built by very large libraries as, as Xavier said um, what is what is your uh, assessment on that topic um, battery variety and then um, related to automated disassembly and the challenges uh, we always look at the variation in the condition of the products uh, so once they return at end of life uh, being placed under a car for 10 years in different conditions, we can expect that the variation in the condition is much higher than what we see today, yeah, where today a lot of the models that are returning are early failures. Yeah, so we can expect that this condition variation will only increase. And at the same time, we also have to acknowledge that if we build dedicated lines for only a limited number of models, that it will be very difficult to balance the capacity or to balance the throughput for the line to make sure that economically viable eh? so in in the whole exercise uh, both in the design of the tooling the vision system but also in the human robot collaborative setting uh, we are investigating okay what is economically viable considering both this variation in condition and variation in the models uh, and how to treat them uh, together um, and, and there yeah that's definitely something that can only be tackled by an approach both in the tooling, making tooling more robust, both in novel approaches in robot control, and of course also in the vision approach. Uh, uh, otherwise, it will be near to impossible. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tero, Tero, do you have um, a comment on that? Because uh, we see also various um, uh, <clears throat> cell cell approaches. Um, we, we have prismatic cells, we have pouch cells, we have cylindrical cells. They are um, assembled in various ways um, um, with different um, yeah, foam and epoxy resin structures. How is that um, making the, the automatic disassembly difficult? And um, what's, the, what's the key measure to overcome it? Or what's, what's in your opinion, the key measure to overcome that? Well, it definitely makes things harder the diversity of the designs and the physical sizes and physical dimensions of the battery packs. And the key to overcome this challenge is utilizing AI and machine vision to detect the battery pack and detect the components. And actually the research work currently is revolving around detecting the components using AI and classifying the components and also detaching the components and creating uh, the frequency plan for this assembly using AI. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, and um, Xavier, uh, for you, maybe you've, you've already mentioned the, the great um, variety of data also, um, the great variety of designs, and then the topic of, of uh, data availability. Um, is, there, is there any chance of collaborating with OEMs, how's the current situation with different stakeholders being involved in, in data gathering? Because, um, well, yeah, for, for this assembly, data is very crucial, but then also for the next step, um, using it as a second life or for mm -hmm. rec rec recycling purposes, uh, data gathering is very crucial. How do you see there? Uh, the collaboration among stakeholders, especially with, with OEMs um, in gathering data. So we are very open to, to um, sharing relevant uh, data. So this assembly is, is enabled. Um, however, today sharing uh, OEMs, sharing uh, a lot of relevant data, um, I would say is, is still a bit limited. Um, with efforts like the battery passport, et cetera, um, that might change. Um, and one more comment to, to data availability. Um, as Jeff mentioned, 
some of the relevant data you will only see in the field once you disassemble uh, battery packs. Um, so to get your tooling and vision really robust, you need to run uh, the disassembly line. Um, of course, this data uh, will uh, is relevant for us and, and we do not share uh, with everybody. Um, but yeah, these are the, the two points. And then and as of right now, can you can you share estimate how many variations of batteries mainly on on the LMT side? And so meaning light uh, light means of transport, I've, I've understood, right? Um, as your key application, can you share how many different types of actual designs of batteries you already have in your library or? Um, as of today, we have um, in the library collected over 400 uh, battery packs, both small and large. Um, and the focus today is on, on both large and, and small battery packs to, to disassemble. Okay, yeah. And um, there's there's a lot of um, technologies involved in that process. Um, Tero, um, a question maybe for you, like how how does advanced technologies such, such as AI or uh, machine learning uh, support these um, yeah, these ways in helping automation happening, and what is actually missing? Is it would do we need um, yeah better better algorithms? Do we need better um, um, yeah brains and and talents? What's what's your point of view on that? Well, first of all, we need a lot of data about all the batteries, and as Xavier mentioned, the OEMs do not give that data very eagerly. So I think that the standardization and regulation has to obligate the OEMs to release the information about the battery packs. And the battery and passport proposal is going towards this direction. So it will obligate the manufacturers to give disassembly lists and bills of materials of the battery packs to ease the disassembly. But we need more regulations for design for disassembly and obligating the manufacturers to design the battery packs for disassembly from the beginning. Because now most of the battery packs are uh, assembled in human robot collaboration. So the robot does the heavy work and the humans connect the connectors and wirings. And we need to change that and we need to design the wirings and the wiring connectors to be removed by robots and detached by robots. And that will ease things up. Quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Thank you. Um, is that is that in, in common agreement from you, Jeff? That we that we need more regulations regarding design for disassembly. Is it is that a topic which is uh, relating only to OEMs, or is there um, anything else regarding regulations where you see there is more need for that? In 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 all the uh, regulatory developments also in the eco design uh, directives for electronics we have been involved for the last year so years uh, on developing assessment methods and also that's what we are doing now developing assessment methods also in collaboration with the joint research center of the european commission to to look at okay what is a good assessment method in which you can assess a human robot collaborative setting eh? and how can you assess how easy it is how feasible it is considering the state of the art technologies or technologies that we consider that will be available by the time the products that are designed today will reach the end of life. And my idea has always been that we have to be careful not to be restrictive. We have to assess, we have to quantify, we have to define targets, but there are many ways to achieve these targets. So we should be careful not to define how the design of a product should look like. And we should also be careful not to yeah, uh, assess only the importance of design for this assembly. There are other uh, many, even maybe more important criteria such as lightweight, robustness uh, in terms of accidents, fire accidents, or also yeah, in terms of uh, sealing towards uh, humidity, uh, which is very crucial for long lasting. And, and in there, we should make sure that these aspects can be assessed in a neutral manner, as well as how easy it is to design the product so that in the end we can make sure that there is a push and a stimuli to improve all these aspects for all manufacturers and that in yeah, ELV uh, requirements we can include it 
but also that we don't set criteria uh, when we don't know what will be the impact eh? because in the end we want a sustainable product and yeah, there are many ways to disassemble a product but of course what we see today is that the design can easily be changed and that uh, robotic disassembly can be facilitated to a large extent without further impact on other aspects. Eh? It, it's just today not considered because today the main focus and in there I have the idea that I, I, all the automotive uh, sector is really yeah, making sure to survive eh, in this uh, quick transition, having a pure focus on the production, low cost of production, robustness of products, and that yeah, because of a lack of legislation, it's not considered. So we have to make sure that first step is that it's considered and that it is becoming a target, but being careful in setting clear criteria yet, as long as we don't no, their interrelation with other aspects that are equal importance, maybe or more higher importance for sustainability. And it's in there that we develop these methods, and it's in there that I'm fully convinced that there is a lot of design improvements to be achieved, uh, but for many different aspects. Yeah. Okay. I'd Thank like you. to um, um, also add a comment here, and um, that is that. Uh, we are sometimes in Europe uh, rather um, quick and good or good and bad at doing specific regulations and that that can um, foster innovation but also potentially harm and therefore um, as Jeff says it's, it's very important where to set the where to define um, the right set of regulations or rules um, to not inhibit that we will have um, cheap and reliable, um, EV battery packs on the European continent. What is critical for, for the European continent is that we become resource independent, that the resources that we import from outside the world, that they stay here and that we regulate, that we enforce that they actually stay here. And um, with these high recycling quotas, which are in many cases only possible if you do this assembly, if you create clean material streams, you can regulate at the at the right um, in the right process step of the of the um, um, reverse battery um, supply chain, um, which are the, the recycling quotas which are being set in place. Yeah, um, keywords recycling quotas is a is a good one. Um, we are, we are for example. Um, also assessing the impact of the uh, European Critical Raw Material Act uh, nowadays. So um, um, key stakeholders will need to give um, reports on their supply chain, as you may know, um, Xavier. So there is a lot of um, yeah, data gathering, actually, both for uh, manufacturers of cells, but also of, uh, battery systems themselves to actually provide those data. Right, because um, there will be need to to report on yeah share of recycled contents, for example, to to uh, determine the recycling quote, but also on on emission based um, 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 emission based um, systems from the manufacturing of the raw materials. So there will be a, the need to report on how many grams of CO two per a kilogram of raw material have been emitted emitted in the in the process of production and, and manufacturing. Is that also in, impeding to a certain extent, or do you think no? That's that's exactly the right way um, to do it, uh, Xavier. This is it's a European Union uh, act, and I'm, um, I guess you're aware of it. Um, yes, I have not a very specific comment. I think it makes sense that we track the how much emissions are being done by by specific raw materials. Um, but um, to do a deep dive, I, I'm not the right person to ask. Uh -huh. the, only, the only concern that we raise there, so it's good to to bring transparency in the supply chain. It it can bring more insights and and more eco labeling opportunities to make sure that customers and companies, yeah, they consider this in their purchase. But at the same time, we have to also be a bit concerned because today it also applies to all batteries that are brought back on the market. Also there, there needs to be a lot of reporting or hey, there is a lot of reporting coming up. 
uh, that we expect that also these companies that refurbish batteries and bring them back on the market, that they have to comply with. And in there, we have to be a bit careful because then we are speaking on smaller volumes. We are sometimes even more of a challenge to have this kind of information. And in there, there is still at this moment a bit uncertainty and clarity on what will be required, but we have to be sure that we yeah, don't overregulate so that a small, medium-sized enterprises, they have such a big administrative burden for especially all the reuse activities, which will be more scattered, uh, which will make this administrative burden even bigger. Right? If you produce and import an EV battery, you will do thousands of the same. If you're in a reuse activity, yeah, then to do all this reporting, there is quite some administrative burden uh, that comes along because of the diversity of what you bring back on the market. So I think we have to I, we have to encourage this, but at the same time also indicate that uh, yeah, we have to be careful for different perspective, different approach for all reuse activities. Thank you. Thank you for, for the answer and the insights. Um, I would like to, to speak um, up another important point. Um, when we talk about battery disassembly, we also talk about um, safety concerns. Um, these are high voltage packs. Usually if we talk about uh, EV batteries, um, up to 400, even 800 volts. Um, Savia mentioned it, there is a lot of um, technical trained labor um, necessary, um, proper equipment and tools, um, and also the, the, the know-how itself, how to deal with, with uh, high voltage systems. So um, Tero, Maybe for you, the, the question, how is the security or um, safety um, relating battery disassembly right now? Um, and and is, it, is it dangerous? Is it not dangerous? Or what, is the, what is the state of the art of safety there? Well, as you mentioned, there is a risk of electric shock and the latest EVs use up to 800 volts of voltage in the battery. So there is also a risk of electric arcs, even fires and chemical hazards of the used EV batteries. But if the disassembly is done correctly, it's quite safe because the person dismantling the battery uses a protective gear. So he has the gloves, he has the overalls and the hood, and always there is two persons doing the dismantling. So in case something happens to the main dismantler, the other one can help him and call help and so on. So it's quite safe. But it's very unergonomic to the dismantlers. They have to have these heavy airs on all the time. It's very hot in that suit. And also they are very clumsy in that suit with those rubber gloves and so on. So it's very unergonomic and very unpleasant work for the dismantlers. And also wearing those boots and those overalls has a psychological effect. So they know it that they are in somewhere they shouldn't be because it's dangerous and that's why it's also mentally very hard work for the dismantler. And if we can re remove the human from the dismantling area and replace him with a robot, it would be an optimum solution. Yeah, I, I understand. So that is for, for low voltage, uh, for rather low voltage batteries than a smaller concern, I'm assuming. Sevier, if we're talking about LMT batteries with, um, yeah, little like smaller than two kilowatt hours, let's say, um, the the issue is, is smaller there, a risk of, of uh, injuries is smaller. Does that simplify the disassembly process in general or how is that? Yes, from an electrical safety point of view, yes. From a thermal runaway, um, in case something uh, goes wrong, um, yes, you have less energy if the battery pack is smaller, um, that will be released. But um, yeah, main difference is electrical safety. Okay, yeah. So we are then further advanced with automated disassembly for LMT batteries compared to EV batteries. Is that correct in general, or is that difficult to answer, to generalize? Difficult to generalize. Okay. 
what is nice in, in this setting is that here, with the, especially with EV batteries, it's kind of a first time that we will have a, a kind of a product category, in my perspective, where we have the opportunity to replace high skilled labor. Right? Because uh, for somebody that is allowed to do this assembly on an EV battery, they need to follow certain trainings and they need to be of a good education level to really consider and understand the safety concerns. Right? So very compared to the research we have done in the past, we are replacing low skilled labor to uh, do the automatic disassembly of electronics here for the EV. Yeah, the safety concerns are of such a level, both for the operator, but also if we think of repurposing, we want to really monitor the whole process, the whole disassembly process, document it correct, so that whatever comes out of this product, uh, of this disassembly process is also safe. And so safety is here also a good reason to do the automation. And there's also yeah, a reason to say, okay, it's not just replacing the labor then sometimes low cost labor, no, it's replacing high cost labor. And it's also allowing to increase the safety of the process. Uh, and then we are not only saying, okay, we avoid human contact, uh, uh, concerns will remain high. I don't think by automating, we will eliminate all the safety, but we can make the process more safe and yeah, reduce the amount of labor, but not eliminate. Uh, at the same time, safety concerns are as never seen before because we are looking for human robot cooperation in a setting with high fire risk, high electrical safety risk, a heavy components lifting. Right? So if they drop, it's not only electrical fire, but also uh, in terms of just falling uh, danger. And then, and so uh, it's bringing a lot of challenges additional to this research uh, and to these developments. But at the same time, also a unique opportunity and I hope that we see from the learnings here, it transfers to a lot of other sectors. I, of course, first one is light means of transport, but also other uh, applications, other uh, automotive applications or electronic applications or even construction, etc. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, big, big topic is uh, responsibility, right? Um, the one that you mentioned, if, if the, the batteries are repurposed in a stationary storage, um, an incident happens um, to prove that the disassembly process has been uh, executed in a correct way is, is much easier with an automated disassembly pro process which can track uh, data during disassembly, correct? This is, this, is, this is how I understood because this is also a proof in the end um, for, the, for the disassembler that the disassembly has been executed according to disassembly uh, process or disassembly uh, yeah, strategies. That's, that's we, how I understood it, right? We see that in, in, in uh, assembly processes as well, eh, that uh, all the tools are tracked, operators ask, ask to confirm, to reconfirm the operations they did. And yeah, by automating the process, we can do this also in an automated manner. And with that, I'm, I'm just stating like, okay, if we automate, semi-automate, and we do it in a structured way, and we monitor throughout the whole process what has been done and with which forces, et cetera, yeah, then we can increase robustness, not only in the process itself, but also assure higher quality of the outcoming materials or uh, reusable components. Yeah. And, and I think that's certainly something that we need to look at how to leverage this in the future. Yeah. Um, and then this, this uh, maybe maybe another question for for Tero. How is um, training of of robots um, possible? Well, we there there can be a library, and and the, the roboter is filled with with data. Um, can come from the design of the battery itself, but it can also be a human taught tool. Is that right? Because uh, from from what I what I understood, there's multiple ways of training a robot. It can be with, with, from the input from the battery design, but it can also be in a human robot collaboration with actually indicating um, where where screws are. Is that something that uh, that you're aware of? And how do we assess this? Yes, you are completely correct on this one. So we can use readily made data 
or we can use AI to generate data for the disassembly, but we can also use the skill transfers. So we can transfer the skill from human operator dismantling the battery to the robot. So actually we can track and record when someone actually is dismantling the battery, we can record and track the actions and convert those into trajectories of a robot. And that's something that we are doing in the research Lake project and focusing on also. And this is something that is going on for many years, or is it a very recent development? Uh, our project started a year ago, and now on the second year, we are actually doing this, and we have started the implementation of the skill, skill transfer about two months ago, so it's very in the starting points yet and under design, and I'm hoping good results from that, because it would be really great to transfer the skills of the human dismantler to the robot cell. Mm. And I think uh, a very interesting terminology also here is the, the depth of this assembly. Um, a recycler is interested in a very clean stream of, of cells. Um, I'm assuming, Xavier, maybe that is, is a question for you. Uh, to which extent is, is uh, depth of disassembly the, the meaning of the terminology? And also, yeah, well, how does it affect this assembly cost? The further I need to disassemble, the higher the costs. Um, is there a trade-off between I, I can only disassemble until module level and then start recycling? Um, is that something you can you can elaborate on? Sure. So today, if you look at large traction batteries, large EV battery packs, the uh, recyclers with the highest efficiencies, they disassemble down to module level, um, ensure that the modules are, are, are deactivated, deep discharged, and then they enter into the recycling process. Um, when it comes to assessing the depth of disassembly, meaning um, from 100 disassembly steps, meaning how many do you want to disassemble? Um, you always want to focus on the um, steps that, on the disassembly steps that take a lot of time and are very repetitive, and those you um, automate first. Um, the ones that you automate last are the ones that um, do not take a lot of time and are, are very complex. Um, those you leave for the, the human operator to, to do that disassembly step. Give one simple example. As I mentioned in the presentation, there are a battery packs with 222 screws um, that you can automate. Um, that's very repetitive. That takes a lot of time. Um, but if there is a specific cable where you need to do uh, a specific a twist and bend of it before it can be removed, that you leave to the operator at the end of the process. I fully agree there with uh, Xavier. And I have to reply to the, the question in the chat of Luc uh, Perrin. Uh, so, we, we see only one company and it doesn't seem to really scale or be actually technically feasible to shred a complete EV battery. A, a large battery assembly to directly bring this in the shredder or in a parametallurgical process that is, to my knowledge, technically not feasible because of safety concerns, because of yeah, how to control the process then in the end. So we need some disassembly. And most of it is up to module level. The question is, uh, what is the cutoff criteria uh, for reuse, but also where do, to stop? Uh, uh, there is some research in opening the modules, but there is also a question, what is the added value? Uh, uh, can we really re reuse the individual pouch cells out of such a pack? Uh, in, in bike or in cylindrical cells, we see it's much more feasible. It's much easier to open it, to uh, unify them again and to bring them into new assemblies for pouch packs and like the modules in there there are many other concerns that they are not that well protected once you start opening it i think that with the current designs most likely is that we have to really think about a good task allocation not just the disassembly depth but also a good task allocation like xavier mentioned and that we have to also be realistic that we cannot go until the lowest level in this assembly uh, that at a certain moment uh, it's either recycling of a, a module uh, uh, or a reuse of module but to reuse individual pouch cells it's still a big question if there is a market if it's really worth it and because if all pouch cells deteriorate more to a similar extent yeah, then what's the value of opening them and to recombine them 
that's also so, mm -hmm. so definitely also dependent on the the EV battery design. I'm assuming because um, for example, we we see different uh, yeah designs in the in the structure of the pack. We see we saw a lot of cell to module approach and then module to pack approach in the past. There's a couple of uh, OEMs also yeah, establishing or exploring the way of cell to pack directly. Tesla is doing this in their famous uh, with their famous round cells, and then they're um, establishing um, or pumping in an epo epoxy resin or a foam. And but also other other OEMs like BYD um, has um, a so-called plate battery, which also gets rid of the actual modules inside the battery um does that does this design trend affect the disassembly does does it um, prefer maybe one or the other pathways one can say well in a, in a tesla battery with cylindrical cells repurposing is not really possible because we cannot get rid of the epoxy resin is that something one can conclude uh, maybe chat can you maybe uh, Yes, we see that the, the market is in its early stage. Uh, we made the same error when we were looking in the recycling of PV panels. First PV panels were glass glass with very thick wafers in between. And we found very unique approaches to open and separate these. We are aware that at the current designs, but when we are talking with large automotive R&D centers, we also know that they are on the drawing tables, looking at completely different approaches, also how to integrate the battery in the full vehicle. Uh, and that, that also the battery chemistries, also the energy density, they are still in a rapid development and both towards the research on ease of disassembly assessment, on uh, robotic disassembly, as well as toward the broader audience and I, for the public, we have to be a bit careful on saying, okay, we are developing this in this way because yeah, it will ch still change a lot and let's hope for the better, but yeah, let's be concerned, if, uh, concerned about it. I, we will still have to continue on this development for robotic disassembly with every new module, every new design coming out, further modifying where the basic principle, let's hope will be similar. Still novel tooling will be needed in function of novel designs uh, where there is a lot of yeah, improvements still to be made uh, we have made combustion engines for 100 years uh, yeah they have changed a lot eh? the first yeah. design now i expect the same for the batteries i hope the same i hope even more but okay we still have to see how it develops and this will have to be developed in parallel like all recycling processes had to cope and had to be careful on focusing too much on early failures on the early failures they can get their hands on to then design the process on. And in there, I think that manufacturers play an important role uh, to sit around the table to early on in the process, take this into account and to have this collaboration between designers and yeah, companies developing the processes for the end of life. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, got, we got five minutes left, I think, for the um, panel discussion, maybe, uh, Tero, a comment from your side also regarding this topic of design of batteries regarding regarding uh, this assembly before we come to the last question. I do agree that the development of EV batteries is also a starting point. So we have been doing actually quite short of time these batteries and the designs will evolve and we will see a lot of different designs in the coming years and let's hope that we get some kind of standardization uh, in next, let's say, 10 years for the battery industry. So we won't have this much deviation in the battery pack designs that we now do have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I would like to, to uh, get into the last question of the um, panel discussion of today. Um, how is the future disassembly process looking like? Maybe we, we talk about the time frame until 2030, five to six years. Um, what are we expecting by then, uh, Xavier? Is it is it going to be a very automated process? Um, 
Are we reducing this assembly times? And if yes, to which to which extent? Um, what is, what so looking at in the future, we'll definitely have a, a large amount of semi-automatic disassembly. The, the, to some extent, the human will still be in the loop. You will increase the, the throughput per operator on site. So imagine today you have one um, expensively trained operator that um, is exposed to um, dangerous situation or dangerous situations that can disassemble one EV battery pack. Um, down the road, uh, we will be able to do uh, three to four uh, EV battery packs uh, per hour instead of um, only one. Um, looking at the technology that will be deployed at Recycler, um, you will have the, the base system that will stay the same. So you will have a, a base robot. Um, you will have a base loading, unloading system. Um, there will be some adaptations to the skills and the tooling. Um, on the one hand side, the software will continuously change, right? If you need to detect new features um, and the robot or, or robot and the factor tooling, uh, there will be um, no uh, one tool that can do everything. There is not yet something like a robotic hand that can lift 50 kilograms and have uh, and can pull cables. So there will be um, some, some changes. Um, and then also, um, Five years down the road, we'll look at some structural battery packs potentially that were heavily used that come off the market. Um, but um, with current designs where battery packs last up to a, potentially a million miles or a, 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 um, yeah, that will take a while until we'll see those in, in large volumes. Thank you. Um, a comment from, from Jeff or, or Tero regarding future battery disassembly in the next years? I have two hopes on the longer term. Uh, one hope is that we build the process around the person uh, so that we don't build a process and try to place a person in between somewhere to still do the difficult things uh, in between all the robots, but that we make sure that uh, there is a person in a comfortable way working and that he keeps control and is able to easily interact, monitor, and uh, jump in where it really needed so it's really valued and the other hope is that there is more involvement from the OEM side so that we see a more not that they do it themselves but more cooperation in which yeah, we make sure that the products they are used as long as possible for what they are designed so we get the most out of our materials and our products and at the same time there is not real incentive for this eco design for, for design the products that last and if they fail to also make sure they can be repaired. That, that's my hope and, and let's hope uh, yeah, with the green deal in mind, companies move also this way. Thank you. Tero, um, a comment from your side. Yes, like Sabri had mentioned, we already have the needed hardware. So we have the grippers and we have all the tools necessary for the robot to disassemble the pattern. The biggest advancement we need are in the software side. So we need to develop the software and we need to develop and train the AI for the task. And that's the key for having more uh, higher level of automation in the battery disassembly in the coming years. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, it was a great discussion. Um, very much enjoyed it. Um, it's it's 6 p.m. right now. I think uh, we can go over to some uh, Q and A session for the next 15 minutes. Um, let me share my my slide for that. Um, um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. I think we can start with those. Um, you, let me see. We got here from top to bottom. Um, well, maybe we can also start first with, um, no, let, let's start first with the chat and then we can also get into, into um, yeah, raising your hands and unmuting yourselves and, and uh, uh, asking questions here uh, in the discussion. So we got a question from Cynthia de Pau. How is this working when the EV pack is not screwed but glued? Can this be handled by your robot as well? I think that is uh, still related to um, to Xavier. 
Okay. Yes, um, even if it's glued, you can bend it open, you can mill it open. And um, as Tero here mentioned already, um, you can also um, free or cool the, the adhesive. And by cooling it, you change the structural properties of the adhesive and thereby it can become much more brittle and you can open it up. Thank you. Yeah, I also see here uh, the answer from Tero that was regarding the question, right? Freezing adhesives to minus 160 degrees using liquid nitrogen breaks adhesives loose. Um, yeah, that we have, yeah. mm -hmm. And then we yeah. have, sorry. <laughs> um, you want to say anything, Theo? Because we have actually tried this, and I also, if you are interested, I can send you a link to a video where we freeze those adhesives loose using liquid nitrogen. Okay, thank you. And we have uh, Luc Perrin. What is the view here on advocating for a complex, expensive automated disassembly process versus the other approach of large recycling equipment capable of taking entire modules of battery packs, as it, as it is suggested by some OEMs who designed those cell-to-pack batteries in the first place? Um, so yeah, really the question here about um, shredding the whole the whole battery pack or rather disassembling it to to module level first and then also um of how oems are pushing this development i'm just throwing the question here into the round now anyone feels comfortable asking sure. answering e Yes, at the end of the day, it boils down to uh, recycling efficiencies. Uh, today, we have not seen um, where processes reaching recycling um, efficiencies that are mandated uh, by the EU in the future with um, approaches where you um, potentially shred the entire battery pack. Um, therefore, it is a, a, a no-brainer to add disassembly steps and um, to enhance the throughput of an operator. Because today, still running operations, the most expensive um, in recycling um, are the, the operators that run around. Um, increasing a bit of capex and thereby the throughput of an operator um, in many cases is, is a very viable uh, solution. Thank you. Um, we have a comment from Mark Rocker here. Before this assembly, you can scan. For example, CT scan the full EV pack and find cracks, swellings, or others before even going down to, to the opening route. We can scan full packs. So that is um, also an answer to the previous question here from, from Luc Perrin. Um, well, this is a topic in, in research. We have also a PhD working on this, uh, on detecting batteries in, in larger waste streams, but also state estimation. The challenge is that, yeah, you can in, in CT or X-ray scans only see deformations and uh, not all defects are causing a deformation. And sometimes it's also yeah, the cost aspect, which is really important, but it, it is for sure an interesting technology to make a non-destructive, non-contact inspection before starting the opening of the full uh, battery pack or module uh, and to have this integrated in, in a further testing line because all other testing approaches for state of health estimation, they are, are quite time consuming. You know, so this can be a nice additional step in the process we believe in strongly as well. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Anita Engler. Um, will the treatment with freezing affect the cells? Um, well, if we have minus 160 degrees Celsius, um, that may affect cells to, to which extent? Um, Tero, maybe you have an, an, an answer for that, how that affects or possibly affects the battery system or the cell? Actually, I cannot totally answer this yet because we are studying this. So our chemistry department is now dipping the pouch shells in the liquid nitrogen and they are doing testing 
uh, does it affect the cells or not? And we will be able to tell this, let's say, within the next few months after the tests have been done. But with the one experiment that we have been doing right now, it didn't affect the cells and they didn't actually cool. Uh, on, they cooled only until to minus 30 because we gripped those off before they cooled to minus 160 degrees. So it wasn't a problem that time. But if we use deep freezing and have to freeze those for a longer time, that I don't have yet answered, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We have a question from um, C. Arroyo. I come from a 30 years experience on remanufacturing printer consumables. From the start, we had exactly the issue of variation of models as a challenge. One option would be to have laws in Europe obli obliging OEMs to design to be repaired in, in case of remanufactured. Are there any lobby movements to force this into manufacturers? And while we are talking about that, trying to make batteries as standard as possible, so variability is reduced, making remanufacturing processes easy. So question here on mainly on lobby movement to force this, this uh, into manufacturers. From my viewpoint, as mentioned a bit before, the, the battery market is not sufficiently mature to really start standardizing geometries or designs at this stage, eh? we, we risk to hinder uh, innovation by standardization at this moment. Although I, I fully agree that also for Second Life, it's it's great if you have more standards and uh, standardized shapes and, and, and but I fear that uh, the, the big discussion and why I don't see this lobbying movements yet, uh, I understand that it's, it's, it's too early there is still too much of improvements to be achieved. Looking at uh, this, yeah, this integration, uh, the, also the production processes that are still being scaled up. So, yeah, I think I think there it's too early, and let's hope we still see significant improvements as a result. Thank you, thank you, Jeff, um, for that answer. Um, do we have anyone else? Um, would like to speak up, um, turn on their camera or, or speak up. I think um, this would be a great chance before we um, also get into a little network se networking session. So if anyone is keen on asking something, please feel free to now. We have so far, I cannot hear anyone yet, I guess, but we have another question in the chat. Um, can you speak a bit uh, on the assessment methods you mentioned? You are focused on at the start, also your work with the JRC. So we have also in the past worked on ease of manual disassembly methods, in which we are looking for methods that can be uh, objective, uh, so in which also, if somebody else would apply it, they would come to the same result, uh, which is crucial if you want to have within a company some acceptance uh, that if it's too subjective, people will not agree or they will find a way around to make sure the product comes out better. At the same time, if you want to really push companies to adopt it, it should be included in a standard uh, uh, approach uh, or standardization to not standardize the design, but standardize the method of assessment so that afterwards targets or eco-labeling can refer to this standardized method as well. And that this can really serve as a kind of a carrot, eh? uh, maybe a stick as well. If we say, okay, market acceptance is only done if you uh, come to such an ease of disassembly. Uh, and in there, the ease of robotic or manual disassembly approach works in the same way that we say per fastener type what are the actions that are needed to be executed? A, a, a sequence of steps. And for every step, we look at standardized timing that are also used in assembly processes. And then we make a sum up of all the different timings in, in how all the different kind of movements have to be done, either by a robot or by an operator. 
And yeah, the novelty that we are working on today is to define, okay, how will a robot Excel look like? What will be the capabilities? And how in there do we have to say, okay, what can be executed by a robot? What can be executed by the operator? And that we divide the tasks based on this assessment method. And there, I strongly believe that this can bring new insights, can also be used as a kind of a tool for the designers to assess their design, to get more insights. But of course, the challenge is to make this representative to, to what a real scenario will entail in terms of robotic disassembly and remanufacturing. And it's in there that we are currently uh, applying this method to different case studies and looking at, okay, is it feasible to improve? Is it representative, the actual challenges that we experience in the lab with these products when doing the robotic disassembly? And it's also there, yeah, something that we do with the GLC and on which we publish openly or uh, are looking for collaboration also with other people because in the end, we prefer a method or we are looking to develop a method in the hope it can be generally accepted and yeah, maybe elaborated on by multiple so that we get a good uh, starting point for a standardization. Yeah, I, I understand. So similar to what is being happening on the assembly side, meaning, for example, with MTM methods or, or other standards, um, yeah, assessing um, this assembly sequences in a, in a standardized way, right? This, this is the... We see for electronics that uh, the repairability scoring uh, is also including the ease of disassembly and the ease of disassembly work and methods are based on prior work that we did for the GRC as well. And so we see that, okay, it's not exactly as proposed, not with the same detail, but still the main ideas are valid. And in here, I think for the automotive, we have to look especially to not only manual, but human robot collaborative disassembly uh, to make sure that our legislation is future proof. Thank you. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, um, doubts or needs, then um, I would like to thank you again um, for, for the good answers and um, intriguing discussions. Um, I think Rose, um, we're gonna continue with, with a networking session, right? Yes, um, well, there is a final question. I don't know if you want to answer if you want to ask it. Uh, oh, sure, sure, we can we can have it. Okay. Um, just... Have any participant already started lobbying work with the European Commission to encourage the emergence of a market of second life for batteries, market design, transportation, or others? Encourage the emergence of a market of second life of batteries. Um, with market is um, a, a platform is meant, um, Francois, can you can you elaborate on that? Yes. Hi, Philippe. Uh, sorry if the question is not uh, so clear. Um, so we are a young company established in France, and uh, what we do is second life for lithium batteries. Uh, what we take um, cylindrical cells and uh, we um, encourage manufacturers for a small, um, let's say, la large scale uh, electronic goods uh, companies to replace. Um, what they purchase in Asia uh, by uh, second life uh, batteries that we, we manufacture. And uh, currently, it's complicated to do because of different uh, reasons. First reason is uh, transportation of used batteries is complicated. Um, certification of used batteries is complicated too. Um, and uh, moreover, in the, in the French um, regulatory environment, uh, we have eco-organisms that are in charge of uh, dealing with uh, used batteries. And they have um, the only way they can dispose of uh, used batteries is recycling. So if you do second life with them, uh, it's out of the regulation. So um, currently, we are working with different uh, um, French, uh, European uh, uh, representatives. Uh, and uh, to try to discuss how uh, we can make the French regulation evolve. But uh, we are considering uh, uh, building a, a European network with other companies that could have interest in developing 
uh, regulatory, um, I mean, uh, to ease its rules uh, in our country and other countries to um, to uh, encourage the use of lithium batteries for second life. Is that clear or not at all? <laughs> uh, in interesting, yeah. So this is something that would be called market for second life batteries. These these regulations or this platform of stakeholders. Maybe. Between? Maybe it is. Um, maybe I'd... operationally. Uh, operationally, what is difficult is to transport uh, used batteries from from the different countries and respect the regulation and also um, certify used batteries in different uh, European countries. For instance, I'm selling a, a bike, e-bike batteries in Spain and uh, discussing with a German uh, certification um, organism. And uh, the answer I have is always, okay, first time, um, it's good to know. Um, and um, to build a regulation for the second life that is adapt, uh, adjusted to our to our challenges yeah um any any answer from um from the panel experts here on on how yeah transportation and also certification um can be addressed In the research, we create one of the project partners, which is Mind Spider from Germany. They are developing actually an electric e marketplace for the second life batteries and second life battery parts. So they will create an online marketplace for the second life batteries, second life modules, and so on. And also, we have EHL, who is developing the safe transportation between different European countries. So they are developing a concept for safe battery transportation in that project. Does that um, help, Francois? Is that is an answer yes. your question? Yes, well, um, thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, Rose, should okay. we should we continue? Yes. Okay. So let's uh, let's start the networking session. So we're going to be assigned randomly to breakout rooms and we should, you know, introduce ourselves, talk about what we do with regards to batteries or any any other interest that you want to talk about. So we will get the invitation to join the breakout rooms very soon. Okay. So uh, it's time to end this um webinar. But before we go, I just want to let you know that we have a new short circuit webinar coming up in October. It's about the battery passport and data management. So if you're interested in this topic, please do register. Uh, it is already uh, an event on the battery burst community. So please feel free to register. Okay, see you all in October, hopefully. <laughs>